So let's say if you have a door, and if you apply a force at these three locations, let's say at point A, B, and C, is it easier to push the door at A, B, or C? What would you say? You'll find that it's a lot easier to push the door at position A, but it's very, very difficult to push it at position C. And even though the forces are the same, there is a quantity that's different, and that quantity is known as the torque. Torque is the force times the moment arm, or lever arm. In the case of position A, the moment arm is greater than that of position B. And so it's easier to move the door at position A than at position B because you can produce a greater torque at point A. At point B, to generate the same torque requires about twice the force as in position A. So it's a lot harder to move the door at the middle or even at the edge of the door on the left side. Now let's talk about the different ways in which you could calculate the torque. So we're going to apply a force that's perpendicular to the door. And let's say L is the distance between where you apply the force and the axis of rotation. And I want to distinguish that with R, the moment arm. The moment arm is the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the line of action. The line of action is a line that's parallel to the force. It extends from the force. So that perpendicular distance is known as the moment arm. So the torque is the force times the moment arm. It's also any perpendicular force times L. But now what if there's an angle? How does the situation change? if we put an angle between the force and the door. So let's say if we apply a force at this position. And let's say this is parallel to the door, so we have an angle theta. How can we calculate the torque now? So first, let's draw the line of action of the force. So that's the line of action. And then draw a line that's perpendicular to the line of action from the axis of rotation. So this line right here is the moment arm. Now we said that L is the distance between where we apply the force and the axis of rotation. So what I'm going to do is turn this into a right triangle. I'm going to draw it separately. So this is R, this is L, and notice that these two, they form vertical angles, so this must be theta as well. So theta is right here. So L is the hypotenuse. And if we want to calculate R from L, notice that R is opposite to the angle theta. So we could say that R is equal to L sine theta using Sokotoa. If you're not sure how to get this, start with this. Sine theta is equal to the opposite side, which is R, divided by the hypotenuse, which is across the box, that's L. And if you multiply both sides by L, then you can see that R is L sine theta. So we know that the torque is the product of the force times the moment arm. And in this example, the moment arm is L sine theta. So the torque is the force times L, which is the distance between where you apply the force and the axis of rotation, and then times sine theta, where theta is the acute angle between where the force is applied and basically the door. So that's one way in which you can calculate it. Another way is to view the problem differently. So that same force 
has a parallel component and a perpendicular component. And here's the angle theta. Notice that theta is opposite to the perpendicular component of the force. Here's the right angle. So the perpendicular component is F sine theta. Now, even though we're applying the force in this direction, this is the component of the force that actually does the work to turn the object in this direction. So therefore, we could focus on just the perpendicular component of the force. And then this is L, which is the same as R in this problem. So the torque is equal to the perpendicular component of the force times L. And the perpendicular component of the force is F sine theta. So in the end, the torque is just F times L times sine theta. So you get the same equation as this one. So now you have all the equations that you need to calculate the torque acting on an object. Now, there are some other things that we need to talk about. So whenever a force causes an object to rotate in a counterclockwise direction, that force will create a positive torque. And if you have another force that causes an object to rotate in a clockwise direction, then the torque generated will be a negative torque. So keep that in mind. So here's a question for you. So let's say this is the axis of rotation. And we're going to apply a 200 Newton force, 3 meters away from the axis of rotation. And at the same time, we're going to apply a 400 Newton force at a distance of 1.5 meters from the axis of rotation. Calculate the net torque acting on this object. Feel free to pause the video. First, let's calculate the individual torques. So torque 1 is going to be F1 times R1, where F1 is 200 newtons and R1 is 3 meters. So this is going to create a positive torque of 600 newtons times meters. So that's torque 1. It's going in the positive counterclockwise direction. Now what about torque 2? Torque 2 has a tendency to cause the object to rotate clockwise, which means that it's going to be a negative torque. So let's call this F2. So torque 2 is going to be F2 multiplied by R2. And so that's going to be 400 newtons times 1.5 meters. We're going to say it's negative 400 because it creates a negative torque. So 400 times 1.5 is 600. So torque 2 is negative 600 newtons times meters. The net torque is basically the sum of the two torques. So the first one is positive 600. The second one is negative 600. So the net torque is 0, which means that the object is in equilibrium. So it's not going to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. Let's try another example. So here we have a propeller that can spin in this direction or that direction or this direction. It could spin different ways. So first, we're going to apply a force of 300 newtons at a distance of, let's say, 4 meters. And then we're going to apply another force of 600 newtons at a distance of 3 meters and at an angle of 60 degrees. And then there's going to be another force, which is directed here. 
and that's going to be a 500 newton force and it's at an angle of 50 degrees so calculate the net torque of the system and the distance let's say it's 5 meters from the axis of rotation so I'm going to call this F1, F2, and let's say this is F3. So the net torque is the sum of all three torques, T1, T2, and T3. So T1 is going to be F1 times R1. T2 is F2 times R2. And T3 is F3 times R3. Now torque 1 is going to cause the object to rotate in the clockwise direction so that's going to be a negative torque. So it's going to be negative 300 times 4. Torque 2 will cause the object to rotate in the counterclockwise direction so it's going to be a positive torque. So it's 600 times 3 and times sine of 30. I mean 60, not 30. Now keep in mind, R2 is L2 times sine theta. So L is 3 and theta is 60. So now let's multiply by F3 times R3. Now F3 will cause the object to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, so it's going to be a positive torque. F3 is 500 newtons. And R3, we're going to use L3 sine theta, where L3 is 5 and theta is 50. So it's going to be 5 times sine of 50. So the net torque is going to be T1, which is negative 300 times 4. So that's negative 1,200 plus T2, which is 600 times 3 times sine of 60, which is 1558.8, and then plus 500 times 5 times sine of 50, which is 1915.1. So the net torque is about positive 2,274 newtons times meters. So that's the net torque of the system. Because it's positive, the object will rotate in the counterclockwise direction. The concept of torque is very useful for leverage. You can use a torque to multiply a force by adjusting the lever arm of a simple machine. So the simple machine we're going to focus on is basically the seesaw. So let's say if you apply a downward force of 300 newtons at a distance of 6 meters from the fulcrum. So this is the axis of rotation. And let's say this part is 3 meters long. What is the output force that will be generated on the right side if you push the left side down with a force of 300 newtons at this location? So what you need to understand is that the torque that's generated on this side, this is a positive torque, that's going to create another positive torque on the right side. So the torques will be the same. So let's call this T1 and let's call this T2. But keep in mind, in this example, T1 is equal to T2. The force that you exert on this side will continue to travel on that side. So T1 is going to be F1 times L1, where F1 is 300, and the lever arm in this example is 6 meters. You can say R1 instead of L1. The result will be the same. So T1 is 1,800 newtons times meters. Now T2 is going to be the same. It's going to be F2, which is basically the output force, multiplied by the lever arm, 
So I'm going to write it as F2 times L2. So T2 is still going to be 1800 newtons times meters, and L2 is now 3 meters. So 1800 divided by 3 is 600. So the output force will be 600 newtons. So notice that the output force, it doubled compared to the input force that you applied to the machine. So you put in 300 newtons, and you got an output of 600 newtons. So therefore, the mechanical advantage of this system is 2, because the machine, it doubled your force. The mechanical advantage is the ratio between the output force and the input force. Now granted, this is an ideal situation. An actual machine might produce a force of 580, 590. It may not exactly be 600, but theoretically, that's what it should be. The ideal mechanical advantage of a machine is equal to the input lever arm divided by the output lever arm. The input lever arm is the lever arm of the input force, which is F1. So that's 6 meters. The output lever arm is associated with the output force, which is 3 meters. So 6 divided by 3 will still give you a mechanical advantage of 2. So this is the ideal mechanical advantage, and this is the actual mechanical advantage of the machine. Now, another simple machine that can use leverage to multiply forces is the shovel. So let's say if you're digging up a pile of dirt and you want to lift it up and move it somewhere else. So you're going to use a shovel to get the job done. So let's say this is the shovel you're using. And let's say this is the axis of rotation. So you're going to apply a force in this direction and an output force will be generated in that direction. Now let's say that the distance between the axis of rotation and where you apply the force is 1 meter. And let's say the output lever arm is 0.1 meters. So if you apply a force of 200 newtons what output force will be generated? So in the last example, we saw that T1 is equal to T2. The torque that you create in this direction will be equal to the torque that's created in that direction around the axis of rotation. Now, T1 is equal to F1 times L1, the input force times the input lever arm, and T2 is F2 times L2 which is the output force times the output lever arm. So the input force is 200 newtons. The input lever arm is 1 meter. We're looking for the output force, and the output lever arm is 0.1 meters. So it's 200 times 1, which is 200, divided by 0.1. So the output force is going to be 2,000 newtons. So notice that the smaller force is associated with the longer side, and the stronger force is associated with the shorter side. Now it works out this way so that the torques are balanced. The torques have to be equal. So now that we have the output force, what is the mechanical advantage of this simple machine? So the mechanical advantage is equal to the output force divided by the input force. So that's going to be 2,000 newtons divided by 200 newtons, which is 10. So that's the mechanical advantage of this particular shovel. It increases your force by a factor of 10. That is, of course, if you apply the force at the edge of the shovel. If you apply it at the middle of the shovel, 
your mechanical advantage will be reduced by 2. It's going to be half of its current value, so it's going to be 5. So your output force at this position will be 200 times 5, or 1,000 newtons. But if you apply your input force at the edge, then the mechanical advantage will remain 10, and so your output force will be 2,000 newtons. So therefore, if you're lifting something with a shovel, you don't want to put your hands here because you're not going to create enough leverage to increase the force. So you're going to be working harder to lift up stuff. But if you want to lift up something heavy with less effort, you want to place your hand at the edge of the shovel. Now granted, you may have to push down a longer distance, but still you can lift up something with a smaller amount of force. The force that you have to apply will be small relative to the force that the machine will generate for you, which will be large.